Miss Jenny Tanchi. Yes. Thank you, ladies. What a privilege it is to be here with you today. You know, the last time I spoke here, there wasn't as many in the room. So this really is a privilege to see the room filled and you ladies all being here. So I'm excited. Are you excited for today, for being here? I think it's always a blessing when we get to be in the presence of people that also love Jesus. So thank you for letting me be here. Thank you for letting me share with you today. So as they said, we're going to talk about how to expect God's miracles. Have you ever thought of that? Have you been experiencing God's miracles in your life? Yes? yes? Praise God. Maybe you guys should come up and speak then. <laughs> Anybody want to volunteer? You know, it's, it's amazing. And I put a picture of the cross up here because I believe us coming to Jesus, accepting him as our personal Lord and Savior is a miracle. Wouldn't you say? God's grace of forgiveness is one of the first miracles that I probably experience in my life. Being able to have that forgiveness of my sins. It's a blessing. And so I'm excited, as I said, to be here with you guys today. I love this quote, miracles are signs of God's marvelous presence and activity. Miracles are there because they demonstrate who God is, how amazing, how wonderful he is. And today we're going to look at three things on how you can really expect God's miracles. We're going to look at how important it is to be intimate with God. You have to be close with God to experience his miracles. You have to have faith in his promises and you have to obey God. I think this is hard, wouldn't you say, for all of us? Obey, right? I always tell my children, you know, obey. When you obey, you will experience blessings. And so let's pray for our time together today. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for these ladies. Lord, we thank you for the time that they've invested to come here to WOW, to be in these groups. We thank you for the facilitators, for the singers, for the speakers, for the sharers, Lord. We thank you that you enable us to do your work. And so, Lord, as I speak, Lord, may it not be my words, but your words. And may the ladies just really embrace a deep, intimate relationship with you, and may they experience your miracles, personal miracles in their lives, Lord, and that they will be able to pass those on to people around them. So bless our time in your precious name. Amen. Amen. So you guys are going through the Joseph Principles. How many of you guys have read this book, The Joseph Principles by Stephen Scott? Anybody? Not yet. Okay, this is an excellent book. So Ellen gave me this book, gave me this topic, and I started reading this book, and I was so blessed by it. And so a lot of what I'm sharing is some from this book, but then it's also from my own personal study. But I want to tell you a little bit about Stephen Scott, because I was very blessed um, by his story. So Stephen Scott had a very close friend, a mentor um, named Gary Smalley, and he died in his sleep in 2016. And you know, Stephen was so heartbroken that he had lost this friend. And he lost his, his passion to write. Because this friend Gary was the one who really encouraged him to write. He was his biggest cheerleader when it came to writing. And it wasn't until 2020 when Stephen got COVID and he was lying in his hospital bed and it was like God spoke to him very clearly. And he said, why have you stopped writing? And he felt very convicted because he had taken those years off, those four years of not writing because of that sadness that he had experienced. And it was like God was saying, you know, move on. Live in the present. Don't live in the past. Start writing again. And then he started to study Joseph's life. And that's where this book came from from his study of Joseph and from his own difficulty in life. Did you know that Stephen Scott failed nine jobs in his life? He start, and then he decided, I'm going to start reading a chapter of Proverbs every single day. And you know what? The wisdom of Scripture changed his life completely. Scott and his business partners have built more than a dozen multi-million dollar companies from scratch. 
achieving billions of dollars in sales. And not just that, but he has become a world-renowned writer and speaker. Isn't that amazing? But what do you notice about his life? He had to fail, but he didn't stop at that failure. He continued to pursue God. And what is our first point? Be intimate with God. Stephen had to be intimate with God before God started to use him. And what did he do every single day? He read a proverb every single day. And not just read it, but he actually applied it to his life. I like this quote. He said, Joseph had an intimate relationship with God, and everything he did that created his success flowed out of that relationship. And we're going to look at Joseph's life today. Where did it start with Joseph? An intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. I'm sure a lot of you guys already know the story of Joseph, but I want to touch on a few aspects of his life. And one of those, you know, you look at the beginning of Joseph's life, and do you remember? He was a favorite child, right? He had dreams, and when he had these dreams, he went and he told his brothers about his dreams, and his brothers were annoyed by his dreams because they're like, what? We're going to bow down to you? We're going to worship you? You're the youngest? This This is ridiculous, and they didn't like him. It actually says they hated him. They despised him, and so Joseph didn't start very well in his life, right? Can you imagine? You're a favorite, but yet your brothers hate you. And so one of the things that I realized in Joseph's life, he had to have that relationship first with Jesus Christ. He had to trust, sorry, with God. Jesus didn't yet come. This is the Old Testament. But he had to have that relationship with Jesus Christ. And one of the things when I was looking at his life, his father had instructed him to go to the fields to find his brothers to see if they were doing okay. Now, if you were Joseph and you knew your brothers hated you, would you want to go look for them? No. You would probably be scared going alone, trying to find your brothers, knowing that they hate you. You wouldn't want to go after them. But look at this verse in Genesis 37, 13. Israel said to Joseph, that's his father, are not your brothers pastoring the flock in Shechem? Come and I will send you to them. And he, this is Joseph, what did he say? He said, I will go. He was obedient, right? He trusted his dad. He probably, I believe he ultimately trusted God. And he wanted to follow his, his father. And we know that, right? Children obey your parents and it will go well with you. So he obeyed his father and he went and found his brothers. And what did his brothers do when they saw him coming from a far ways away? Oh, there's our brother. Let's, let's plan to kill him. Let's get rid of him. They didn't like him, right? They wanted to get rid of him. But, you know, God had another purpose and another plan. You know, we look at, of course, Joseph wasn't killed. We know that, right? His brothers actually sold him. And where did he end up going? He ended up being sold into Potiphar's home. And you know what's amazing? In Genesis 39, it says, The Lord was with Joseph, so he became a successful man. Was God with Joseph? Yes. Why was God with Joseph? I believe because Joseph believed in God. He had a relationship with God. He believed in his promises. And he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. Now, his master saw that the Lord was with him and how the Lord caused all that he did to prosper in his hands. So even his master saw the intimate relationship that Joseph had with with God. And because he was walking with God, God prospered him. You know, Joseph could have complained, right? God, I obeyed my father. I went and tried to find my brothers. I found them, and then they threw me in a pit, and then they sold me, and now I'm stuck as a, a servant in this Egyptian's house, this foreigner's house. God, where are you? You know what? I tried to search the scriptures, but I didn't find any complaining in the life of Joseph. He trusted, but I believe it started with that intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. But it didn't stop there. Remember, he was accused. He was accused of trying to sleep with Potiphar's wife. Another downer in his life. And then he was thrown into prison. But... He continued to trust and follow God. I believe he prayed. 
he prayed a lot. And look what happened again in Genesis 39, 21. It says, but, but the Lord was with Joseph and extended kindness to him and gave him favor in the sight of the chief jailer. Was God with Joseph? Yes. Did Joseph have that intimate relationship with Jesus? Yes, he did. Ladies, continue to develop that intimacy with Jesus. If you want to hear God's voice in your life, you need to be with him. You need to be spending time with him. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you, James 4, 8 says. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. You see, in order to come near to, G- to God, we have to cleanse ourselves, right? We have to be pure. We have to be holy. You know, in this case, I don't know exactly why God allowed all these things in Joseph's life, but I wouldn't be surprised if it was he was trying to develop his character, You know, he wanted to see, is Joseph really trusting me? Does he see my my plans above his own? Joseph did follow. You know, you might ask, how do I actually draw near to God? Here's some things. I'm sure you guys know these already, but just to refresh your mind. Believe in God, right? To have that intimacy, to draw close to God, you have to believe in God. Not just a theory of God, but you have to believe in who he is. And in believing, you study the Bible, you pray, you worship him like we did earlier. You get into a discipleship group, right? You get involved. You yourself disciple. You serve. That's how you draw near to God. You confess your sin. This is very important. Confess your sin before the Lord and stop sinning. And obey God in everything. It's very easy to obey God in some things, or maybe the things we're okay with obeying, but are we willing to obey God in everything? And I believe Joseph understood this. He trusted and believed in God, even in the difficult times. He believed that God had a plan and a purpose for his life. Do you guys also believe that God has a plan and a purpose for your life? The way you can find out is you stay anchored and intimate with him. Our next point, have faith in God's promises. Faith is not a feeling. Do you believe that? Yes. A little weak, but yes, we can't base faith on our feelings. Because, I'll admit it, we're women. We're emotional, right? And feelings do change. But faith cannot be anchored in our feelings. I like what Stephen said. It is a fully embraced persuasion in one's heart that always produces an attitude or action that expresses that persuasion. Faith is our belief that God will do exactly what he promised. Faith is not emotion, as I said. It is a decision to believe God's word and promises and live by them. You have to believe them. You have to have faith. You can't allow those seasons in your life when, you know, you're praying for a miracle, right? And God doesn't answer exactly how you pray for it, right? Stephen, I'm sure he was praying. Well, his, his friend died in his sleep, right? But I'm sure he was questioning and wondering, God, why? But God used that in his life, and I'm sure God used it in many people's life to continue to be anchored on God and not allow situations or circumstances to change our faith in who God is. Genesis, Joseph had to step out in faith, right? He had to trust that God was working in him. And there was a dream, right? Pharaoh had a dream. And Joseph, was Joseph able to interpret it? It was God through Joseph that he was able to interpret it. Genesis 41, 15 to 16 says, Pharaoh said to Joseph, I had a dream, but no one can interpret it. And I have heard it said about you that you, when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. And what was Joseph's response? Joseph then answered Pharaoh saying, it is not me. God will give Pharaoh a favorable answer. You see, when God uses us, It's not us. We should never, ever take credit for what God does. God does do miracles. God does use us. But all the glory, all the credit needs to go to God. And that's what Joseph saw. He saw that he was just an instrument of God's putting him there at that moment, at that place to use him. 
But I believe it was that intimacy with God. It was that faith, believing, having faith in God's promises. And because he put them there at the right moment, he was able to interpret God's dream to Pharaoh. Stepping out in faith. When God works miracles, we must always give him the credit, right? We should never steal an ounce of God's glory. I think this is what my mother-in-law always says. Never steal an ounce of God's glory. It belongs completely to him. And he deserves all the glory and praise. God just chose to use us to work his miracles. Again, what is amazing, you know, after God placed him there, after he was able to um, start storing food, right, there was a a great famine, and his brothers came to him because they needed food. And I love even how Joseph realized that it wasn't, you know, everything that he brought him through, it really was for God's purpose. And I love what Joseph said to his brothers when he finally saw them. You know, he could have been angry. He could have been cruel to them. He could have harbored that bitterness, that unforgiveness towards him. But what did he say? When Joseph saw his brothers, he said, please come closer to me. And they came closer. And he said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. Now, do not be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. Did Joseph understand why God, him, God brought him there? Why he went through all of those things? He did. You know, I think a lot of times, especially when we're praying for miracles in our lives, right, we might not understand what God is doing, but we have to trust his process. And I believe that's what Joseph did. He trusted the process that God was bringing him through. And in, in the end, he was able to see God revealed to him why he went through those things, why he placed him in Pharaoh's court. It was for a purpose. It was to save his family and the Israelites from the famine. Do we trust in God's promises? Again, in in Genesis 45, 8, he also said, Now, therefore, it was not you who sent me here, but God. And he has made me a father to Pharaoh and lord of all his household and ruler over all of Egypt. You see, Joseph knew it was God who placed him there. So when praying for miracles, also ask God, God, what is it you want me to learn from this? What is it you want me to do? Sometimes we miss out on miracles because we're not asking the right questions. God, what is it you want me to do for you? I like this illustration. You have to classify faith in two different ways. I like this tri- chart here. Sorry, you can't really see my arrows. But there's two, classify in two ways. There's the general aspect of faith, right? What does that mean? God exists and is love just righteous. We believe. I believe in God, right? I base my beliefs on the Bible. That's great. I have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. So that's general faith, believing, trusting in God, being in his word. But then there's the specific aspect of faith, and that's a word from God, stepping out in faith, stepping out in obedience. This is based on a specific action or an attitude on a word from God that applies to a specific situation in a specific moment. What do I mean by this? Sometimes, do you ever get that um, thought in your head, like, reach out to this person, Share the gospel with them. Invite them over. Do you ever get that? Does God ever speak to you very clearly? Okay? You can believe in God. You can have that personal relationship with Jesus Christ. But when God tells you something specific, maybe you don't want to do it. But do you step out in faith and say, okay, God, I'm nervous. I don't know how my friend's going to take this. But I will step out in faith and share with this person, with this stranger You put yourself out, you know, you let go of your inadequacies, your fear, and you say, okay, God, I'm willing. You're listening to God, right? He's telling you something, and now you step out in faith, and you actually do it. Are the feelings always there? Not always. But sometimes we step out in faith because we believe in the promises of God. Let's look at the life of Paul 
And for those of you that were here Sunday, my husband spoke on the life of Peter. But I wanted to just show you this. In Matthew 14, Peter said to him, now this is, they were on a boat, right? And they saw Jesus from the distance. And they didn't know, was it for, is it really Jesus? And so Peter said to Jesus, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And what did Jesus said? He said, come. And Peter got out of the boat. Did he have faith? Yes, he got out of the boat. And he started to walk on the water. And he was coming toward Jesus. But what happened to his faith? He started looking at the wind, and he became frightened, and he began to sink, and he cried out, Lord, Lord, save me. And immediately, what did Jesus do? He stretched out his hand, and he took hold of him, and he said to him, you of little faith, why do you doubt? Why do you doubt? A lot of times we believe in God. We said, yes, we'll follow you, God. We believe in you. But then what happens? We look, look at our situations. Lord, why are you causing this sickness? Why did you cause this death? Why are you causing these financial problems, right? We start to look at the problems, and we take our eyes off of God. Peter lost his focus. His faith, he believed in God. But when he got so consumed by the wind, by the waves, he started to sink. Ladies, keep your lives anchored on Christ. Remember, you have to keep your focus on him. Don't become consumed by your problems. Because when we become consumed by our problems, we can't really minister to others. We can't allow God to help us through those difficulties because that's all we focus on. I think Peter got what Jesus is trying to say. I like Hebrews 11.1. 1. It says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. It's obedience, right? It's taking God at his word, knowing that he is faithful. Even when we fail, he is still faithful. And he abides by his promise. Faith. Stepping out in faith, trusting God, trusting his promises. I want to tell you a story of Walter and Helen. Walter and Helen Jesperson, both of them were single missionaries to China. Walter went in, it's kind of blurry there, <laughs> 1936, I believe. He went as a, China to, uh, he went as a missionary to China. God called him. And, you know, back in those days, you know, they didn't really know what China was like. They had to take a boat. It was only from what they heard from other people who had came, come from China to their countries. Walter was from Canada. And so it was only what people told him about China that he knew. But he knew that God had placed in his heart to go into missions. And China was the place that he wanted to go to. And so he stepped out in faith and he trusted God. He said, okay, God. I don't know the language. I don't know what I'm getting into, but I will trust you. So he decided to go to China. And even the fact of, you know, he wanted to get married someday. someday. His family, they were dairy farmers. He loved farming. He was great at farming. He loved that kind of lifestyle. But because God called him, he stepped out in faith and said, okay, God, I will do your work and I will serve you. So he left. He went to China. He was there for many years. And then Helen... Helen also received a word from God, go into missions, go to China. A single lady. Back in those days, it wasn't easy. They didn't have all the conveniences that we have now. And she too, she didn't want to go, but she really felt God's calling in her life. And so what did she do? She stepped out in faith, got in that boat, went to China, learned the language, and started ministering to the Chinese people. Did she want to get married? Yes, but that was a dream, but she knew that she needed to obey God. And the beauty of their story is that they both were with the same mission, and they were both um, in generally the same area in China. And I believe because of their faithfulness, because of their obedience to God, God connected them in China. They were able to meet, and it was in China you see their wedding picture here, they were able to get married. 
And they stayed in China for many more years, even raising their family for a number of years in China. Why do I share this story? Sometimes we don't always trust what God is doing or asking us to do. But we will never experience his miracles until we actually step out in faith. These are my grandparents. You know, yeah, amazing. These are my grandparents. Would I be here today if it wasn't for their faith? And they're trusting in God and his miracles to work miracles in their lives. And I could stand up here all day telling you of the miracles that they experienced in China. But what am I trying to tell you, ladies? We only experience God's miracles when we actually step out in faith and say, okay, God, I will trust you. I will believe in your promises. I will do what you ask me to do. I am so blessed. My grandparents were missionaries. My parents were missionaries. And now I believe God is using my husband and my life also to minister to people. It started with them. I praise God. And I just want to share it with you, that legacy, because you guys can have the same legacy in your families. But you have to be faithful to what God has called you to do. My last point, obey God. Like I said, is that easy? No, it's not. It's not easy to obey God. The evidence of our love for God is through our obedience to his command. Do you get that? The evidence of our love. Do you, believe, do you love God? I think we all can say that we love God. My second question, are you obeying God, right? The evidence of our love for God is through our obedience to his commands. And in our obedience, we begin to experience the miracles that God does around us, in us, and through us. But it starts with obedience. You know, when you look at the Bible and you look at the New Testament and you look at the miracles that God did, the miracles that God usually gave were with a command, right? Jesus would use a statement or a command when performing miracles. When obeyed, the miracles happened just as Jesus said they would. Let's quickly look at some of these miracles. These were faith-based miracles. Jesus told the servants to empty the water jugs with water. What did they do? They obeyed. And more than 120 gallons of water were turned to wine. This is a John 2. Jesus told the man who had been sick for 38 years to get up and walk. He could have said, but I haven't been walking for 38 years. But what did he do? He obeyed Jesus' command and was healed. Jesus told the paralyzed man, get up, take your mat and go home. What did he do? He obeyed. Was he healed? Yes. You have to obey in order to experience the miracles of God. Jesus told Lazarus' sisters to remove the stone blocking Lazarus' tomb. What did she do? She obeyed, and Lazarus came walking out. Jesus told the young man who was born blind to wash his eyes in the pool of Shilom. He obeyed, and he received his sight. Jesus told the disciples to throw their nets on the other side of the boat. They obeyed and caught many fish. Jesus told the man whose daughter had died, don't be afraid. Just believe. The father believed Jesus and his daughter came back to life. What do you see in these miracles? Jesus gave a command. And what did these people do? They obeyed. Obedience is so important in us experiencing miracles. Look at Paul's life too. I love this. In Acts 16, if you have time later, read this. I love this passage, but even Paul's obedience. And I think this is something that we can even see in our own lives. You know, Paul was obedient. He had a vision, right? He had a vision. Paul's obedience to preach the gospel in uh, Macedonia. He had a vision. It started with a vision. And what did he do? Immediately, he sought to go immediately. He didn't wait around saying, oh, let me check my schedule. Oh, I think I'm busy this week. Oh, I don't know if I can go next week either. No, he got a vision for the Lord. And what did he do? Immediately, he decided to go. And then when he got there, he preached to the women. Why the women? I'm not sure. But maybe because we talk a lot <laughs> and we will spread the message, right? But he preached to the women. And who responded? It was Lydia. She opened her heart to the Lord. What am I trying to tell you, ladies? 
When God speaks to us, we need to act immediately. And if you just see in this one passage how many people came to Christ because of Paul's obedience. So Lydia opened her heart to the Lord. And then there was a slave girl that kept coming and bothering him. And then Peter cast out, or sorry, Paul. I messed up there, not Peter. Paul cast out the spirit from the, the slave girl. And then the people around him were so upset because this slave girl was actually making money for them. He was thrown into prison. And then what did he and Silas do? While in prison, at midnight, were they sleeping? No, they were praying and singing hymns to the Lord. They were worshiping God. Is it a privilege to serve God? Yes, it's a privilege. Did Paul and Silas see it as a privilege? Yes, they saw it as a privilege. And then there was an earthquake, a miracle. The chains were unfastened. The doors of the prisons were opened. The jailer got so scared, right? He was about ready to kill himself because he thought all of his prisoners had escaped. But what did Paul tell him? Wait, let me tell you about Jesus. And the jailer believed. And not just the, the jailer, but his family. They all believed. And what did they do? They wanted to be baptized. Why do I share this story in Acts? Because Paul was faithful to what God called him to do. And look at all these lives. This is just one story of Paul's life. But all these people came to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Their lives were changed. Is that a miracle? Yes. But it started with obedience. Ladies, God wants our obedience. My last story. You know, for me, it's not always easy to obey. And I stand up here very humbled because there's many times, I must admit, that God pierces my heart with something. He tells me to do something, and I have many excuses, and I feel ashamed. You know, there's been times, you know, I'll be sitting next to someone in a plane, and God will be like, talk to them, share with them. Oh, but they're sleeping. You know, I have so many excuses. Have I missed out on God's miracles? I believe I have because I haven't always been obedient. But let me share with you this story about Anna. This young lady is a friend of my husband, and they were in the same barcada, barcada in Ateneo. And just two years ago, she was diagnosed with cancer. And she had gone to so many treatments and doctors, and basically they were saying, there's really not that much money more that we can do for you. You can try some of these experimental drugs, but we don't know. We don't know if there's anything we can do. And so my husband and I were praying. We were praying, Lord, can you do a miracle in her life? Can you save her? Can you heal her from cancer? Because she doesn't yet know you. That was our prayer. Lord, do something in her life. Save her. Use this also for her friends also, that they can see your power, your might by healing her. And there was this one evening that some of our friends were deciding to get together for a dinner. And my husband and I, we had had a long day. We were tired. It was raining super hard. And we were thinking, ah, maybe we'll just, we'll pass Nalang. We'll just not go to the, the dinner. But then my husband was reminded, this girl's going. Anna, she's going we should go. Let's make an effort to go. So we said, okay, let's go. So we got in the car. We went to the restaurant. She wasn't there yet. There was just three of us, and we were chit-chatting, and then she arrived, and she sat right in front of us at the table, and we started talking with her, you know, how are things going? How is the, the treatment? And she just share, started sharing, and she just started sharing the pain she was going through physically, but not just that, also the, the pain of not really having anybody there to walk her through this. You know, that's hard. It's one thing to be sick, but it's hard also to be sick and not have someone to be with you. She and her husband were separated. They had a 14 year old son, but she was walking this journey alone. And so Paul looked at her and he said, You know what? Where are you at with your relationship with Jesus Christ? And she started tears. She says, I don't know. But God hasn't been a big priority. And Paul started sharing with her, can I share with you the love of Christ? And so he, could, he started to just share how much God loves her, how God wants 
to have her become part of his family. So he shared very clearly with her. And, she's, and then he asked her, he said, would you like to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? And she said, yes, I would. And so we prayed with her that night. We prayed with her and we said, hey, we want to be here with you. We want to walk you through this journey. We will continue praying. We'll be praying for a miracle. And, you know, we left that night with joy in our hearts because she wasn't healed from cancer, but God healed her heart and brought her into his presence. Story's not over. So this is a picture of Anna DJ. This was the dinner we had with a few people that came. So I continued to message with her, um, talk to her, asked her if she needed anything. We had dinner May 21. And a couple months later in September, she got sent to the hospital. Her body was starting to shut down. And we were able to do a Zoom call with her, pray with her. You know, we were continuing to pray for a miracle in her life. And um, she wasn't doing well. And my husband had to go to Zamboanga for business. And we're like, we, we got to get to the hospital. We don't know how long she's going to last. As soon as he came back, um, the same day he came back, my husband and I went to the hospital. And when we entered her room, her family was there, and they were saying she just took, uh, she just declined. Like, she just, she's not talking right now. We don't know if she's going to make it. And, of course, you know, you're, you're, you're so burdened, you know. You've been praying. You've been praying for a miracle. You're, you wanted to see her one last time face to face just to reassure her that she has a relationship with Jesus. And then she, was, she wasn't going to make it. So we enter the room, and her family's crying, and we're there, and she can still hear us. And so we start talking to her, and we start telling her, God loves you. You know, you've accepted Jesus. If he wants to take you, you can go to him. And we were, Paul was able to share with the family members. And we were just there, and they had called her son to come because they didn't know how much longer she was going to make it. And so we were there. We were talking to the family. We were praying with them. And Paul had to step up out for a little bit. And she flatlined. I was there by, with her. She flatlined. It was me and her sister. And we just put our hands on her. And I put my hands on her. And I said, Anna, run to Jesus. I said, you've made a commitment to Jesus. Now you run to him. You run to Jesus. He loves you. Run to him. And she passed away. I don't know why God took her at that moment. But Paul was talking to some of the people in that room, some of her family, and they said, you know, after that dinner that you had with Anna just three months earlier, she, something in her changed. She, she wanted to live. She wanted to use her life to serve God. God changed her just in those short months. And, you know, we waited for her son to come. And Paul was there, and he walked her son into the room. And, of course, her son was so shaken. And Paul said, you know, this is just a shell of your mom. But your mom is now with Jesus. Can I also share with you how you will be able to see your mom someday? And Paul was able to walk the son through, you know, trusting in God, believing in God, even if God took his mother that he, if he chooses to accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, would also be with his mother someday. And he accepted Jesus. Why do I share this story? Because it started with the thought that we've got to go to this dinner. We don't know when it, we're going to be able to see her again. We don't know God's plan for her. It starts with obedience. It starts by trusting in God's promises. God wants all of us to know him. He wants us to come in and be a part of his life. But how many of us are doing our part also in sharing with others his plan and his purpose and his love for them as well? Anna experienced who Jesus was in those few short months. She accepted Jesus as her Lord and Savior. And I am so excited that I can say one day I will also see her again. So sometimes we pray for miracles, but sometimes those miracles aren't exactly 
how we pray. But I believe God gave her this time on earth for a purpose. God brought her to himself, and now she is worshiping and rejoicing, free from any pain and sickness. And now it's her son. You know, we're trying to reach out to him, so continue to pray for her son. Pray that, you know, he will also be able to make sense of all of this and that he will really trust in who God is. God does miracles. I think it, oh, there we go. So God does mir- do miracles. We have to just be willing to step in and do our part. So what did we talk about today? Be intimate with God. You have to have that, you have to have that intimacy with God. You have to have faith in his promises. Sorry about that. So intimacy with God is so, so important. Have faith in his promises and obey God. If you can do these things, I believe God will use you to do his miracles around you, in you, and through you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much. For your word, we thank you that it's living, that it is active. And Lord, we thank you that we can be part of the things that you're doing around us, that we can be part of the miracles that you're working. And I just pray, Lord, that you would be the one to help us to really become closer to you. Because I, I know, Lord, that we're so distracted by busyness, by things that we need to do, but maybe aren't the most important. So Lord, I pray that we will really carve out time to be intimate with you, that we will just really choose to trust you and be faithful to you, that we will believe that your promises are real and that we will be obedient and obey you in the things that you've called us to do. And Lord, I pray a special blessing on these ladies, Lord, that you will expand their borders, that they would be used by you mightily in their friends' lives, in their families' lives, Lord, that they will not be discouraged when they pray for changes in their personal lives or even in their family members lives lord that they will trust the process that you're bringing them through lord that their eyes will always be on you not on the circumstances or the situations but on you alone lord and may you be the one to fill us and guide us in our daily lives we love you jesus in your precious name amen